who have never spent 350 hours on any issue in the Scriptures. But this man, who is an excellent servant of Jesus Christ, as Paul writes to Timothy and wants him to be, is an expert student of Scripture. He is very skilled in handling the Word of God. Thirdly, an excellent minister avoids the influence of unholy teaching. He stays away from unholy teaching. Fourthly, an excellent minister is disciplined in personal godliness. And these two go together. Verse 7 says, Refuse the profane old wives' fables and exercise yourself rather unto godliness. Avoid the unholy and pursue the holy, is what he's saying. Go after the godly things. Have a reverence for things holy, divine, a worshiping life. Don't exercise for the body. It profits for a little time and a little effect. But godliness profits all things, not only in the life that now is, but, is the, but in the life that is to come, the eternal life. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. This is something everybody knows. Exercise unto godliness. An excellent minister is disciplined in personal godliness. He seeks to draw nigh unto God with a holy life. Number five, an excellent minister is committed to hard work. We saw that last time, verse 10. We labor, we suffer reproach, simply should be translated, we strive unto agony. We work hard because we are serving the living God. We are serving in eternal matters, the God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. In other words, we recognize eternal salvation is the issue here. We are serving an eternally living God who offers an eternal salvation, and so eternal destiny is the issue. That's why we work so hard. That's why we endure pain and difficulty, because we understand the consequences are eternal. Then last time we closed with the sixth quality of an effective or excellent minister, and that is in verse 11, an excellent minister teaches with practical authority. These things command and teach. There is a place for teaching, the articulation of truth, but it is in a command mode. An aggressive, confrontive, commanding of people to obey the Word of God is coupled with instruction on how to do just that. That's command and teach, command and teach, command and teach. Do it and here's how. Do it and here's how. Now, I said last time that that kind of authority is built, first of all, on your view of Holy Scripture. If you believe in an inspired and inerrant text, you know it is authoritative. Secondly, it's built on your understanding of the Word of God. To preach authoritatively, you want to believe it's God's Word, and then you have to know what it means. If you don't know what it means, how can you authoritatively speak it? That's why in seminary it's so important to teach people the principles of hermeneutics. That's from the Greek word hermeneua, which means to explain or translate or interpret. They need to know how to explain the Bible, how to interpret the Bible. They need to understand the principles of interpretation. How do you find the meaning of a passage? How do you work with the language and the, and the context and the culture and the geography and the history and all of the factors that go into interpreting the Word of God? They need to learn that in order that they can rightly divide the Word of truth and not be a workman who should be ashamed of what he does. Authority comes in from a view of the Bible that says it is God's Word. And secondly, on top of that, you have to build another foundational level on the basis of understanding what it says. If I believe it's God's Word and I understand what it means, then I can speak it with authority. Third thing would be the urgency regarding the need of men to hear it. I will speak with conviction and authority when I understand how urgent it is for you to hear it. And fourthly, obedience to the Lord. I speak with authority because the Lord commanded me to do that, and I want to be obedient. Now, if, if you don't believe it's the Word of God, or if you're waffling on that view, you can't be authoritative. If you're not sure what it means, you can't be authoritative. If you don't think it's that big of a deal for men to hear it, you're not going to bother to be authoritative. And if obedience to the Lord isn't a priority, you may not bother to do it either. But if those things are in place, you're going to teach in a command mode. There's going to be a firmness and a strength and a boldness and an aggressiveness to your teaching that says this is what God says, this is demanded, you must respond or suffer the consequence. So the excellent minister has authority, pursues godliness, studies the Word, warns his people, works hard, and avoids unholy teaching. That's all in the past. Let's go to number seven. It's a very important and basic truth. An excellent minister is the model of spiritual virtue. The model of spiritual virtue. In other words, he is the tupas. The word example in verse 12 is tupas. It means the model, the image, the pattern. 
It's a pattern laid down. You put a piece of paper on it and you, you draw on that paper the pattern underneath that's coming through. It's the model that you set up when you're going to paint a picture and you paint exactly what you see like still life on a table. You set it there and that's exactly the way you paint. It's the example of setting a pattern of living that others can follow. That is really at the very heart of excellence in ministry. In fact, Thomas Brooks said, example is the most powerful rhetoric. Somebody put it this way years ago, your life speaks so loud I can't hear what you say. Your life is your most powerful message. And men in the ministry somehow need to learn that. Recently, a friend of mine visited his alma mater, a well-known seminary in our country, and he suggested to them that the thing he noticed when he was there and the thing he noticed in the graduates coming out from there was a lack of an understanding of true godliness. And he said, I would like to suggest that the seminary add a class along the lines of holiness and godliness in personal life, and the rebuttal of the professor was that wouldn't have any academic credibility. Well, academic credibility isn't the issue in the ministry. The issue in the ministry is a godly life, is the model of spiritual virtue. That's the issue. Give me a godly man, and I'll show you someone you can pattern your life after. Give me a man whose head is full of knowledge but doesn't have virtue in his life, and I'll show you a man you better run from because you're going to get confused. And you'll start to live like he does, having all the right truth and none of the right behavior. And that kind of a dichotomy is deadly and frightening. The single greatest tool of leadership... The single greatest tool of leadership is the power of an exemplary life. It's the bottom line. Notice verse 12. Paul, writing to Timothy again, whom he wants to be an excellent minister, says, Let no man, that's comprehensive, let no one, look down on your youth. How are you going to turn that around? By being an example of the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Some versions say in spirit, but that was added later in the manuscripts. doesn't appear in the earlier ones. Just five. Word, conduct, love, faith, purity. You're to be an example in those areas. Now, all the authority in preaching, beloved, you need to understand this. All the authority in preaching is useless. You can command and demand and speak and so forth. It's useless if it isn't backed up by a virtuous life. It's useless. Whenever the pattern of godliness isn't in the life, it sucks the power out of the ministry. And it becomes hollow and shallow. Sometimes people ask the question, you know, so-and-so is such a good preacher and so forth. Why doesn't anybody go to the church? Well, it might well... One of the gifts that we opened was a $100 gift card to Walmart from Stephen's uncle. And this was a big deal to us. And we were super grateful for that gift. His uncle had never really given us a gift that big before. And so it was just a a, a wonderful, pleasant surprise. And a few weeks later, Stephen was headed out the door and he said, hey, where's that gift card that Uncle Russell gave us? And I, you know, I got a bad feeling. (laughs) And... um, so, you know, I casually started looking in like the, the normal places you would look like in you know, my wallet. I was like, well, is it in your wallet? And we couldn't find it anywhere. So then we both started looking and we looked and we looked and I'm not going to lie to you. Um, we got into a, a fight. I was going to say a little fight. We got into a big fight over it. This was not my finest Mrs. Better Half moment. We fought over who had the card last. We fought over whose fault it was missing. We fought over why we couldn't be more responsible human beings. We're like grown up adults now. And why didn't we value the card more? And it wasn't good. And um, eventually we stopped looking and we went our separate ways. And I just decided it must have accidentally been thrown away. Two years later. I was decorating our house for Christmas, and in the bottom of the storage bin of decorations was that $100 gift card to Walmart. It had been in the house all along. Now, guys, I got to tell you, 
I looked in empty suitcases, diaper bags, wallets, drawers, pockets, cars, everything that I could think of to look, but I never thought to look in the Christmas decoration bin. And it just made me think that a lot of the things that we're searching for are at the bottom of places that you don't think to look. Three times in 10 verses in the Bible, Luke tells us that the baby would be found in a manger. Why did he say manger three times in 10 verses? I think it's because a manger is the last place that you would think to look for a baby. That's how they were going to know it was the right baby. The angel didn't say, go look for a newborn baby, because quite frankly, all newborn babies look the same. They're scrunchy and goopy and crying. They look like little aliens. I'm not really a baby person. (laughs) But look for a baby in a manger? Now that's not something that you see every day because a manger was a feeding trough for animals. A manger was an ordinary, mundane, glorified dog bowl. And throughout time, there are a lot of places that people might put a baby, a crib, a cradle, a basket, a drawer, a person's arms. But the last place that you would think to find a baby would be a feeding trough. And the message to the shepherds is the same message to us. Something good is here right now, today, but it's not going to be where you expect it. But when you find it, it's going to bring you great joy. And you're never going to be the same again. Last week, when Pastor Stephen was ending his message, have you ever, the people who like to take notes, sometimes when Pastor Stephen says, stand up, put your notebooks down. And then he says like the best things. And I'm like, no, 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 no. So last week, at the very end of his message, he just like shoots off things that I would make a whole message around. And He tells us, he says, be looking for the good. And he said, you're going to find it this Christmas in dirty places, annoying people, and simple moments. And when he said that, I was like, whoa, I think that's my sermon. So I wrote it down. (laughs) And I just want to just, you know, expound on that because I like more words than him. Right now, today, can you find the good in the dirty places of your life? The places that you don't want anyone to see. You know, the unfiltered places that no one's going to see in your Facebook feed or in your Christmas card. We all have those places. Your marriage is a manger, it's messy. It's imperfect, and there are places in it that you don't want anyone to see, but there is good to be found in your marriage. Can you find the good in annoying people? There's good in your teenager. (laughs) There's good in that annoying coworker that you sit next to or work with every day? What if this Christmas season, you went around looking for the good in your family? Now, this might be, actually, this is harder to live out than it is for me to just say it from the stage. But let's all together try to, rather than seeing the things that drive you crazy, about people, maybe you can focus on the things that they do well. Surely you can find something or the things that they have been through that can give you compassion for the way that they act or the way that they treat you or treat others. There's good to be found. And then there's what he said, the simple moments. Can we just spend some time over the next few days seeing, finding, looking for 
the mundane manger moments. This week, I started thinking about the simple moments in my life. And I wanna see the good in the ordinary moments. Because you see, when I said at the beginning, God wants you to have space to hear him. God, God wants you to have space in your schedule. I'm not saying that you have to get up earlier or stay up later or cancel something. I'm saying, can you see the good in everything that you do? Like, like driving my kids to school, simple, every day. And let me tell you, the Furtick children, they do not have a mother who is a pleasant morning person. <laughs> and most days, we leave our house 7-10. That's the goal. And most days, the traffic is bad, and I'm dropping them. We're like peeling in on two wheels at the last second, and I'm like, run! <laughs> so don't get any, get any ideas. They're not beautiful, meaningful comments. I don't like it, but God is watching how you manage money, and God is watching how you manage mankind. God cares how you treat me. You might not like me, but God cares how you treat me. God is watching how you treat me. Not just me, uh, the least of these, the inmates, the person that's in the hospital, the poor people, the destitute, the, 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 the people that need care and love. God is watching how you treat mankind. Not just your kind. Oh, that went right over your head. I saw it. It just flew like a dove. <laughs> yeah, mankind. And so these three parables embody that. I won't deal with all three parables because I'm focused on one. This text is about the moment of marriage. And the problem is, in this, in this Western culture, when we hear them talk about marriage, it does not line up with our point of reference. Because our marriages are not like that. We don't have 10 virgins. I mean, we got, you know. I didn't mean it like that. I mean, we, we probably do have about 10. But, but, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just having a little fun with you. Glory to God, hang in there, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. You're gonna be okay, breathe in, breathe out, it's gonna be okay. But we don't have a wedding that requires 10 virgins to be prepared with oil because our cultural understanding of a wedding is something Jesus is not using. He is using the, the Hebrew customs of marriage to explain marriage. And, and when I talk to some of my Nigerian friends, any Nigerians in the house make some noise. Yeah, y'all's y'all, weddings are a better reflection of what the weddings were like in Jesus' time than our weddings are, as I understand it anyway. Your weddings require multiple parts. There's difference what you call the white wedding, which is the part we have, that's all we have. The white wedding, that's all we can afford. But, but when I describe the Hebrew wedding, I think you're going to really relate to it. Uh, because in the Jewish marriage, it included a number of steps. Uh, first was betrothal or engagement, which involved the prospective groom traveling from his father's house to the home of the prospective bride, paying the purchase price if it had not been paid already, thus establishing the marriage covenant. So the covenant begins before the wedding. To be betrothed, or let me use a modern word, to be engaged was a covenant. Sometimes the arrangement was made while they were children and they never met each other. And there was a price paid, gentlemen, there was a price. You didn't just get to marry her because she was fine and five foot nine. It cost you something. I think if we paid a little bit more going in, we wouldn't end up paying so much going out. <laughs> See, in our culture, you pay backwards. You have to pay to get out. 
in their culture, you had to pay to get in. You'll get it later, never mind. And, 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 and so it cost him something to do that. And if the groom delivered the payment and paid the price of betrothal to start the engagement, it was as much a covenant as the wedding. That's why when Joseph heard that Mary was pregnant, he said, I'm going to put her away or give her a bill of divorcement, and they weren't even married yet because they were still in covenant. Are y'all getting at you with me so far? You with me? Can I go deeper? So the groom would travel and pay the price for her and leave because he couldn't marry her until he had built her a house. And it was not uncommon for the groom to be gone over a year or more building her a house. Whoa, that kind of reminded me of, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. I shall drink no more wine until I drink it new with you in the kingdom of God. In my Father's house, there are many mansions there. If it were not told, I would have told you so. But I'm not going to put you in one of them. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I will receive you unto myself that where I am, Oh, y'all aren't with me. So she's waiting for him to come get her, and she does not know exactly when, she, when he's coming. Her bridesmaids don't know exactly when he's coming. They have to be ready at a moment's notice. So, because once he comes, the celebration begins. There are two parts to the celebration. There is the wedding feast, which is crowded, or the marriage supper of the Lamb, where everybody comes and you have to have a lot of people to come to the supper, and then there is the ceremony where only few can enter in. I need you to understand, because not only do we not understand the kingdom, we don't understand the parable because we don't get married like that. We drive down to the JP in a pair of blue jeans and a T-shirt and a ring that we got from Walmart. And Can you imagine somebody espousing you and they gone for over a year and you don't know when they're coming back? Now, they didn't have FaceTime. So you had to trust. And we're living in a time now, if you go to Walmart and stay too long, where you been? Can you imagine being gone for over a year and you remain pure and you remain committed and you remain in focus? You had to have discipline. You had to have faith. You had to have integrity. You had to have endurance. You had to be long-suffering. You had to be prepared. And you had to be clean. You had to be smelling good. You had to be... In 1967, Joseph Stalin's only daughter flees Russia for her new home, America. Hello to everybody. I am very happy to be here. That story alone is worthy of a podcast, but Svetlana Svetlana is about what comes next, and it's the craziest story I've ever heard. It has KGB agents, a Frank Lloyd Wright commune, weird sex stuff, three Olgas, two Svetlanas, and one neurotic gay playwright. That's me. Listen to Svetlana Svetlana on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Paper Ghosts is a true crime podcast investigating the mysterious disappearance and brutal, unsolved murder of Tammy Zawicki. They just kept telling us from the beginning, she'll, she'll be back, she'll be back. We had no clue where she was. Didn't know where to begin looking. Tammy's story shocked the nation. 
The deeper I searched, the more troubling things I found. The best lead, the best evidence, the best witness was blown off. Listen to Paper Ghosts on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. In 2018, it was reported there was a dramatic rise in the number of cases of demonic possession. For many of the most disturbing cases, Father Carlos Martins was often summoned. I have seen things, very evil things. I order you to go in the name of Christ. I'm not leaving. We've been together too long. He needs me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I've got sunshine. Yeah, that's how I feel today, man. On a cloudy day. Boom, 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 boom. When it's cold outside, I got the month of May. Well, I guess you say, what can make me feel this way? Today. That's what it is. Today. Talking about today. Today. Yeah. Gratitude, man, will affect your altitude, which is in correlation with the attitude that you have. But if you straighten out your gratitude, it will immediately affect your attitude, which is in direct correlation with your altitude. I don't care how you want to twist it up and say it. It, ta- it starts with gratitude, man. Nothing bigger. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. I appreciate you, God, showing out again. Got me up, gave me another chance. I appreciate it. And today, my focus will be on what you want and not what I want. Huh. Mm. What huh. you want Anna and Jane. not what I want. Mm-hmm. I'm sick yours. of me. Yeah. That's what I've come up with. Prepare yeah. yourself. Tired of thinking, trying to figure it out, and all like that. I'm sick of me, ladies and gentlemen. But I'm grateful. Welcome to the Steve Harvey Morning Show. Shirley Strawberry, Carla Pharrell, Mouth of the South Junior, and the legend that is nephew Tommy, a junior. Yes, sir. What's what's on your mind today? Let me let me ask you this, uh, cause you know it's Black History Month. You I look just like wanna... you're glowing today, too. I I don't know on. what it is, uh, You know, it's a gratitude. I'm just glad to be you here. You got man. a ring <laughs> light or something on your Zoom? What you got? What's yeah, that? I got a ring light. You know, just light up place. You know, but oh, let me okay. ask you this, uh. Uh-huh. Another black moment you've had, uh, just one of your blackest moments you've had with the Kings of Comedy. I know there had to be plenty of black moments on this tour that I can say on the air. Oh, wow. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, Yeah, that would be one. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, okay. I got to tuck at least 89, 90% of these black (laughs) ass moments away somewhere. (laughs) Oh. Many. Celebrate Black History Month. We was on a tour bus one time, cause mm-hmm. like if we was performing like uh, close, like if we was going from Indianapolis to Cleveland mm-hmm. or Indianapolis to Columbus. Matter of fact, that's where we were going. We we're on a tour bus one time. All of us was on the tour bus, and uh, Boomerang was explaining to said Swanee, Bernie, uh, and. Uh, Bernie's boy, uh, what's my, I can't think of his boy's name. Oh, um. Anyway, and DL. And Boomerang was explaining to him that he used to be a pimp. Mm. And they were not wrapping their mind around that concept <laughs> of what it, because, you know, they, these cats have had jobs and careers, got wives. And they were just looking at Boomerang. And when he got through talking, it was so confusing. It really never said pimp. And I, my had to jump in right there and straighten them up and tell them what they meant. And this is the radio version of it, and that's why it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We didn't have we'll take no it. black we'll take ass it. kings of comedy moments that I could tell on the radio. Why has we done like that no more, Jim? All right, coming up at 32 minutes after the hour, we'll hear from the nephew as he runs that prank back right after this. You're listening to the Steve Harvey Morning Show. In 2018, it was reported there was a dramatic rise in the number of cases of demonic possession. For many of the most disturbing cases, Father Carlos Martins was often summoned. I have seen things, very evil things. I order you to go in the name of Christ. I'm not leaving. We've been together too long. 
He needs me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Paper Ghosts is a true crime podcast investigating the mysterious disappearance and brutal, unsolved murder of Tammy Zawicki. They just kept telling us from the beginning, she'll, she'll be back, she'll be back. We had no clue where she was. Didn't know where to begin looking. Tammy's story shocked the nation. The deeper I searched, the more troubling things I found. The best lead, the best evidence, the best witness was blown off. Listen to Paper Ghosts on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. In 1967, Joseph Stalin's only daughter flees Russia for her new home, America. Hello to everybody. I am very happy to be here. That story alone is worthy of a podcast, but Svetlana Svetlana is about what comes next, and it's the craziest story I've ever heard. It has KGB agents, a Frank Lloyd Wright commune, weird sex stuff, three Olgas, two Svetlanas, and one neurotic gay playwright. That's me. Listen to Svetlana Svetlana on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Americans, Mm -hmm. Venezuelans, yeah, well, they have reason for it. Like, like my most, cons- a lot of the most conservative friends and associates who I have, whether it's, it's people who are friends of mine, whether it's workers or Mexican Americans in LA, they also, they don't want Mexico to come over here. They don't want open borders. Many of them, they left that. Why is that hard to understand? They tend to be, you know, cat Catholic families. So if you think about politics for four minutes a week and Somebody comes in all of a sudden and they're talking about socialism, defunding the police, and then announcing all sorts of gender complexities. You know, and I say this as somebody with a, you know, I always, I, I, I preface it to say, you know, I, I, have, a, I have a trans godson, uh, you know, lesbian sister. This is not like where my personal politics are for what people should be allowed to do and where my personal politics fall are very different than what I think the priority and the, and the ranking of discussion is. If you're going to go talk to somebody who thinks about politics for four minutes a week and bring up elaborate critical race theory and, and like, and start to talk to them about the fact that boys aren't boys and girls aren't girls, and they should just announce this and have announcements at the age of 18. I don't think any Democrats grasp when you think about politics four minutes a week and they talk about Trump and his transgressions, which I believe are more damaging and dangerous than those of the left. But I don't think anybody has any idea the kind of transgressions that that represents to people who are either on the center or on the right. Well, the four minutes a week thing really is interesting, too, because one of the things I was really struck by over the last four years with all my encounters with journalists, many of which were good, by the way. I had lots of good encounters with journalists, but the worst encounters I ever had were always, almost always with journalists as well, is that the journalists think about the world politically all the time. Like they're every single decision they make, every, I mean, obviously this is a generalization, but if you're in that world, everything is political. But for the typical person, That's just not the case at all. And that's actually good. One of the best political science theories I ever read was predicated on the idea or put forth the idea that um, in a highly functioning political system, especially a democratic system, the less people think about politics, the better the system is working. At towards the end, I didn't think politically at all. I'm not even interested in politics. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't, I mean, it's, I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, one of the things I think a lot about is I have I have a friend, one of my closest friends who you've met, born again Christian. He was raised as a son of a missionary um, all through other parts of the world. And, you know, but he lives in LA. He, he, he worked a bit in the industry, a very um, rounded conservative friend of mine. He has gay friends, friends from whatever. But he went in the booth and told me during the election in 2016, he said, I just went in and I thought, Forget it. I'm voting for Trump. I can't. I can't bring myself to vote for Hillary Clinton. I was really angry at him at first because it was like, and then I realized I shouldn't say really angry with him, but I was. I, I realized that I didn't understand that for the things that I saw, for the clouds I saw massing on the horizon with Donald Trump, and we're seeing some of that here with his the, the legal threats to the election, trying to undermine the election security, his own large, largely appointed Republican judges shooting a lot of that down. There's a lot of things. We don't need to get into all that because everyone can have an answer for everything that I say. 
But the realization I had with him was, oh my God, he is a canary of a particular coal mine. He's a guy who rides a motorcycle, yeah. he likes guns, he likes kind of different kinds of freedoms. He he in a different he has a different relationship with freedoms versus security than I do. I'm a canary down a different coal mine, right? Part of that might be from me looking at the sort of authoritarian shadowiness that I saw coming in with Trump. That's what I alert to. I can't decide that my friend who I know and love and who has been in my house and accepts my friends, my family, everybody, and has a broad range of friends and family. I can't determine that he's either foolish or dumb or wrong or a bad person anymore. I can't determine that he's an ignorant canary down an ignorant coal mine, right? Because if he's my friend and I'm that close to him and he's here in LA and that's a choice he made, I better listen to what that was even if the gut instinct for him. And so then I was thinking about this a lot. And one of the things that I think has been a blessing of the Trump presidency is there's some conversations we're having now that are, that are awful and hard. Like it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's, we talk about this all the time, obviously with young, with Freud, you get, you go through hell before you get anywhere else. We wouldn't be having any of these conversations if we were now in year four of a Hillary Clinton presidency. We're having different conversations. They're worse right now in a lot of ways about race, about class. But the the fact that has stuck with me the most, and, and one of the things I'll say is I went in open-eyed all the way down to assess my party and the political situation. I've only gotten more disillusioned and angry with the Democratic Party. Okay, okay, so okay, so let's let's go return to that. Okay, I'm I'm gonna keep that in mind. Let's return to that. So you put together this team or this team was organized to produce messages that would support the Democrat, the Democratic Party fundamentally. But the but the overarching philosophy was one of self-criticism, let's say, if, if the self includes the Democratic Party. And what other what are the rules? What were the other rules for the messaging? See, I don't think people are going to understand exactly what you did. You made these ads, but you went out and did it with your own team. And so who are the ads generated? How are the ads generated? Who are they targeted to? What was their consequence? And what were what were the rules that you used and agreed on when you were making the ads? And how did you agree on them? Sorry, that's a lot of questions, but... Part of this is it was so, it was all entrepreneurial, George. It was all outside of the political. If I, I'd still be waiting for the first approval from the DCCC to do my first, you know, $2,000 commercial. We couldn't wait for it. The, the, the fiefdoms and bailiwicks within the party and yeah. the institutional, just bureaucratic mess is sufficient that, that a lot of what got done got done with a network of people entrepreneurially and free market, right? That's so, pretty funny, really. So, Republicans. Yeah. Yeah. And it gave rise to it. And really all that it was, was, was our own ethical bearing. You know, I, I ran the thing. And so I, we did testing to make sure we were, that the ads were effective, that we weren't just shouting at each other on Twitter and getting the most likes. And, and what would, how you know, define I, effective? How do you know? Forward. I mean, we had, we had, there was a woman who's incredible who did, you know, we did testing focus groups. We saw, how they move people. I mean, I can send you deck after deck after deck of the analysis. Okay, so you were um, looking at necessarily... you were looking at pre uh, post exposure shift in political attitude as a consequence of the That's right. advertisements. And what was nice was that our gut instinct. Me, and by that I mean me, Marshall, Billy, Lita, Sean. Our gut instinct was we're not going to make Trump bashing ads. We made some when they were fair. That was a big important thing. Like I did the one with for Republican voters against Trump where it was, uh, it was just Reagan city on a hill speech. And I just showed Reagan, I just showed Trump doing the opposite in every regard. For the first time in our memory, many Americans are asking, does history still have a place for America? There are some who answer no, that we must tell our children not. Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and you're listening to the Bible in a Year podcast, where we encounter God's voice and live life through the lens of Scripture. The Bible in a Year podcast is brought to you by Ascension. Using the Great Adventure Bible timeline, we'll read all the way from Genesis to Revelation, discovering how the story of salvation unfolds and how we fit into that story today. It is day 188. We're reading 2 Kings chapter 22, 2 Chronicles chapter 33, and we are reading now, not from Psalms, but from the book of Proverbs, one of the wisdom books, Proverbs chapter 7, the entire chapter of chapter 7. The 
The Bible translation that I am reading from is the Revised Standard Version, the second Catholic edition. And I am using the Great Adventure Bible from Ascension. If you want to download your own Bible in a year reading plan, you can visit ascensionpress.com slash Bible in a year. You can also subscribe if you'd like to subscribe, but it is day 188. No more comments. We're reading 2 Kings 2-2, two, two, right? Fun to say. We're also reading 2 Chronicles 33. We are praying, kind of, more getting some wisdom from Proverbs chapter 7. The second book of Kings, chapter 22. Josiah reigns over Judah. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Hilkiah finds the book of the law. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, son of Meshulam, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may reckon the amount of the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people, and let it be given into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the workmen who are at the house of the Lord, repairing the house, that is, to the carpenters, and to the builders, and to the masons, as well as for buying timber and quarried stone to repair the house. But no accounting shall be asked from them for the money which is delivered into their hands, for they deal honestly. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Josiah hears the law and is penitent. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the secretary, and Asiah the king's servant, saying, Go. Inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Akbor, and Shaphan, and Asiah went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they talked with her. And she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon its inhabitants all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But as to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words which you have heard, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace." and your eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. The Second Book of Chronicles, Chapter 33 Manasseh's Evil Reign Over Judah Manasseh was twelve years old when he began to reign, and he reigned fifty-five years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the sons of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which his father Hezekiah had broken down, and erected altars to the Baals, and made Asherahs, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom and practiced soothsaying, and augury, and sorcery, and dealt with mediums and with wizards. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. 
and the image of the idol which he had made, he set in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will no more remove the foot of Israel from the land which I appointed to your fathers. If only they will be careful to do all that I have commanded them, all the law, the statutes, and the ordinances given through Moses. Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that they did more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. Manasseh restored after repentance. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they gave no heed. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks and bound him with fetters of bronze and brought him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God received his entreaty and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Afterwards, he built an outer wall for the city of David west of Gihon in the valley, and for the entrance into the fish gate, and carried it round Ophel, and raised it to a very great height. He also put commanders of the army in all the fortified cities in Judah, and he took away the foreign gods, and the idol from the house of the Lord, and all the altars that he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord, and in Jerusalem, and he threw them outside of the city. He also restored the altar of the Lord, and offered upon it sacrifices of peace offerings and of thanksgiving. And he commanded Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. Death of Manasseh Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer to his God and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, they are in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. And his prayer and how God received his entreaty and all his sin and his faithlessness and the sites on which he built high places and set up the Asherim and the images before he humbled himself, behold, they are written in the chronicles of the seers. So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his house. And Ammon his son reigned in his stead. Ammon's reign and death. Ammon was twenty-two years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. If you'll turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20 will be our scripture lesson for the evening. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Our Heavenly Father, once again, as we open your law in this evening, as we uh, struggle with a difficult task, ta text, we would ask that you would assist us, that you would give us hearts of understanding, that you would give us ears that would hear. Uh, may we handle your word aright. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We come to one of those texts this evening that, once again, presents challenges to us. One particular, as we will see as we read through the chapter, that you may encounter, may have already encountered in times past, as an objection to the faith, but we continue and press forward with this second giving of the law, Deuteronomy chapter 20, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt, is with you. When you are approaching the battle, the priest shall come near and speak to the people. He shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are approaching the battle against your enemies today. Do not be faint-hearted. Not be afraid or panic or tremble before them, for Yahweh your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to save you. The officers also shall speak to the people, saying, Who is the man that has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him depart and return to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle and another man would dedicate it. Who is the man that has planted a vineyard and has not begun to use its fruit? Let him depart and return to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle and another man would begin to use its fruit. And who is the man who is engaged to a woman and has not married her? Let him depart and return to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle, and another man would marry her. And the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Who is the man that is afraid and faint-hearted? Let him depart and return to his house, so that he might not make his brother's hearts melt like his heart. 
When the, officers have, when the officers have finished speaking to the people, they shall appoint commanders of armies at the head of the people. When you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. If it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. However, if it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. Then when Yahweh, your God, gives it into your hand, you shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. Only the women, the children, and the animals, and all that is in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as booty for yourself, and you shall use the spoil of your enemies, which Yahweh, your God, has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not of the cities of these nations nearby. Only in the cities of these peoples that Yahweh, your God, has given you as an inheritance, you shall not leave anything that breathes, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, as Yahweh your God has commanded you, so that they may not teach you to do according to all the detestable things which they have done for their gods, so that you would sin against Yahweh your God. When you besiege a city a long time to make war against it in order to capture it, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an axe against them, for you may eat from them, and you shall not cut them down. For is the tree of the field a man that it should be besieged by you? Only the trees which you know are not fruit trees you shall destroy and cut down, that you may construct siege works against the city that is making war with you until it falls. Amen. So here is the 20th chapter of Deuteronomy. And we have at the beginning instructions for battle. And we might wonder, well... As interesting as this is, what kind of application can we make today? Once again, there is a concern for justice and a concern for the welfare of the people of God. First of all, in this matter of warfare, in this matter of going out against a people, and we certainly see that this happens a great deal when we read the historical books, we, we read about what took place in those days, we can be thankful. Uh, I think that... Um, we do not have as much warfare uh, in, our, in our land anyways. Uh, certainly as we look at the world, there is a great deal. But in those days, uh, again, we're talking about the people of God here. And when they go into battle, the exhortation to them is that they are not to fear their enemies. Do not be afraid or panic or tremble before them. Why? For Yahweh your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And so, again, the context that is envisioned here was not, after, after David and maybe Solomon, was not a common experience of the people of Israel. Uh, once the people of Israel began to decline in their worship, uh, began to decline in their leadership, uh, this kind of a situation was was not very common, and hence the, the instructions here uh, are almost idealistic in the sense that uh, when you have the, the officers saying to the people, who's built a new house, uh, and uh, you haven't dedicated it yet, you, you go on home. You know, can you see some of the evil kings of Israel who want to have as many men as possible on the field because they really don't trust God. They're not doing this because they're uh, serving God. They're, they're actually uh, idolaters in their heart. They're, they're not going to ask these questions. They don't care if someone has dedicated their home. They don't care if someone has planted a vineyard. They don't care if someone is engaged to a, a woman and has not married her yet. Let those people depart. They don't care. And certainly, uh, we can understand when you get to the last uh, who is the man that is afraid and faint-hearted? Let him depart and return to his house so that he might not make his brother's hearts melt like his heart. We certainly know one thing. We know that in battle, and certainly uh, battle in this sense, up until uh, there, there were periods of time when the, the Romans developed certain weapons that sort of had a range to them. Uh, but, but battle up until the modern period was a very personal thing. Until you had long-range cannon and artillery and machine guns and things like that, battle was pretty much one person against another person. And it was up close and personal. And so in that situation, when one person falters, 
uh, maybe you might get, if you get two or three together, and they falter and they begin to run, uh, there is a mentality amongst mankind. Once certain people are running, I think it might be time we run too. And so you can certainly understand, you know, if, if you think, if you're faint-hearted, if you think you're going to turn and run, why don't you leave now? Let's leave the people here that, that actually want to be here and that are actually pursuing this for the proper purposes. Again, how often did that end up happening? Certainly during the days of Joshua, I would imagine it would. Uh, maybe a, a couple of the, the righteous kings of Israel, you know,